honor to be joined by Kate Moss, um, who has written this brilliant new book, which is a celebration of a thousand women from all corners of the world, um, historical figures who have achieved so much. Um, Kate herself, um, who I'm sure needs no introduction, but for those who don't know. Is a historical how. figure. Yes, <laughs> not at all. Oh, um, an award-winning novelist, playwright and non-fiction writer, the author of nine novels and short story collections, including the multi-million selling Languedoc trilogy, the Burning Chamber series, and number one best-selling Gothic fiction, The Winter Ghost and the Taxidermist Daughter. She's also written four works of nonfiction, four plays, contributed essays and introductions to classic novels. Her books have been translated into 38 languages and published in more than 40, 40 countries. Um, she's the founder director of the Women's Prize for Fiction, the largest annual celebration of women's writing in the world. And she's the founder too of the Global Women in History campaign launched in January 2021 to honor, celebrate, and promote women's achievements throughout history and from every corner of the world. Um, so I mentioned in that introduction there, the Women, women in History campaign, and this, can you tell us a bit about how, well, this book came about and how actually that campaign played a part um, in the formation of this book, Warrior Queens uh, and uh, Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is wonderful to be here this evening. I've had a brilliant time listening. And I feel a bit um, of a fraud coming on afterwards because I'm not a historian either. I'm just curious. Um, you know, I'm a reader and I'm curious. And then also following Giles on. Um, <laughs> but before I start, I, I do have to, can I, can I just say my Camilla story? So I have, <laughs> because, you know, I'm obviously not as funny as Giles, but um, I had a really similar experience to Giles, which is I was at a thing at Ronnie Scott's. I can't remember what it was for, and it was a, a private thing. It was a book launch. Um, I, I can't remember why. Anyway, I was moving away, and I thought I was desperate to go to the loo. So I went down the corridor, and I walked down the corridor. I thought I could smell smoke, which was quite weird in these days, even in these days. Um, and I got around the corner, and there was a woman having a fag who went like this. <laughs> and I said, and she said, oh, um, nobody saw me. I said, I didn't see you, um, but I'm just going past. We had, you know, went past and did all of those things. Years later, when she was, it turned out to be Camilla, <laughs> um, we met at something and she looked at me and she said, you, you didn't betray me. <laughs> I was like, there we are. We have, you know. So there we go. That was that was the story. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, that was not the question you asked, but I felt yes. I really did have to join in in the in the Giles yeah. thing. Um, so mm -hmm. the the way the book came about um, was that during the yeah, lockdown of twenty. <laughs> thank you, Luke. <Lydia. laughs> this is brilliant. This is Luke's Josh's. first live event, yeah. and um, he's already bring a brilliant hand. Yeah. She's not this paying me extra or anything yeah, no, exactly. as well. Um, <laughs> so. I just felt during the, the third lockdown, I think for many of us, there had been um, an experience at the very beginning of it. And many of us who have got older children suddenly had our grown up children home and it was sunny. And then as the time went on and we saw the complete level of political incompetence, to put it mildly, um, corruption, to put it more um, truthfully, and the lack of leadership and how depressing everything was in that January of 2021. I had a novel coming out and I like going out. I, I like meeting readers. I like hearing readers, even when they go, oh, I didn't understand chapter seven or, you know, this wasn't as good as your last one, which you sometimes get. Um, and you just say, well, thank you for reading them both. I hope you, <laughs> I hope you bought them. Um, um, but so I thought I'd like to do something to mark publication. So I asked um, a few writer friends um, because all of my historical fiction is about telling unheard and underheard women's stories. It's about the fact that we were always there too. <laughs> the world was made up of all of us, and it always has been. And so that, I just thought, well, I'll ask people to tell me the one woman from history they'd like to celebrate or they think should be better known. And so um, I asked, um, Anthony Horowitz said uh, a woman called Lascarina Bubalina, who was the great uh, Greek admiral um, who sort of raised the fleet against the Turkish invasion. She's the only woman to have ever been made an admiral by the Russians. Um, and she was just the, the huge figure. There's a massive statue of her at Spetses looking out over the water with her extraordinary sword and her head scarf and looking out over the ocean. Uh, Lee Child said the women of the Special Operations Executive. Uh, but Bethany Hughes said Theodora of Byzantium. Claire Balding said Lily Parr the great, uh, great British footballer who was a superstar in her day and who was the only woman footballer to whom there is a statue in this country. 
And so little by little, I just asked people to say this and, you know, 10 people took part. And then I thought, I wonder if other people would want to do this. So I simply, <laughs> it's the only time this ever happened to me. I'm in my 60s. It's never going to happen again, I'm sure. Um, I got social media right <laughs> just, for, just for one day. Um, and so I, I, I just put out a tweet saying the same thing. Name, just tell me a woman from history you'd like to celebrate who you think should be better known. And within days, I had thousands of people from all over the world. And I don't think it would have happened if it hadn't been lockdown. And people, you know, I'm still... Oh, God help me, I'm still an idealist. I still believe that most people want to build up rather than pull down, and most people want to include everybody rather than, you know, have a wedge push between them. And I started to learn about huge numbers of women, many of whom I did know, but many of whom I didn't. So a young woman in China saying, have you read the poet Ding Lim? And I didn't know her work. Um, a woman in Saudi Arabia telling me about uh, the great uh, woman Huda Shahari, I've, I've got the name down there, I can never say it, but who was the person coming back from the International Women's Suffrage Conference in Paris in 1923, took off her headscarf at Cairo Station. Um, and it was the beginning of that wave of liberation, which of course we are seeing exactly the opposite at the moment. And so I just started to think, you know, what about a book? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I'm a writer um, and, you know, let's use this material. But um, that is the genesis of the book. Other people saying, have you heard of them? And some people said my granny. Other people said my auntie or the person who brought me up. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought, you know, I read a huge amount of history and I love history and I'm curious about the world. And many of the people I'd never heard of. So it's interesting you mentioned that the people who, who would give examples of uh, their own ancestors, those who were probably extraordinary in their own right, but maybe not, um, you know, these huge figures of history who've achieved so much compared to, you know, the millions of others. And, you know, in the book, um, you mention a lot of women who have achieved in extraordinary ways, especially because of the obstacles that they had to overcome, whether that was in, um, you know, the arts or the scientists and warfare, etc. cetera. Um, one of the points you make in the book is that, you know, we, we talk about unheard and unheard uh, women as you know, part of the problem is that if we, especially if we don't have the sources, some of these stories are quite difficult to find and some of the voices are lost. And it's one of the things that you want to correct with the book is actually to bring these voices back. But um, it's easier to find sources about elites, about those who've achieved a lot than it is about ordinary people or um, ordinary women. But did you find in the course of your research, did you manage to find um, any stories or any indication of how ordinary women, those who maybe weren't of the upper class or who just, you know, worked ordinary jobs, how they might have responded to these women who were making headway in their own societies in different fields? Yes, uh, plenty. I mean, I think I think the thing is, in the context of this evening, um, we've been listening in a brilliant session that we just heard, and obviously Giles is, is fantastic, is that history is a pendulum. It's a lovely myth, maybe, that things will, each generation, as we know more, will get better. But that isn't how history works. You know, we can see this right now, that it's not how history works. So there are two ways of looking at that. One is to be very depressed, you know, that you will never reach the sunny uplands. The other way is to think, well, it will correct again in the end. And that's the only way for me that I can, uh, you know, cope with some of the things that are happening at the moment, to think is it will find a new balance in the end. So once you start to do that, the question you ask yourself is, OK, and this is what Hannah was, and Andrew were talking about so eloquently, what is history? Who gets to decide? Who gets to decide what is preserved and what is valued and what is neglected and forgotten? And it's what real historians call the silence in the archives. So if only a very narrow band of people are thought of as being the great men of history, and therefore it is only the things about them that are preserved, then the things about all the rest of us just don't get put in the archive in the first place. So they're not there to be found. So therefore you are always, whether you're a novelist or a historian, have to be a detective because you have to look for the gaps, the space between what common sense tells you and what the history book might be telling you. And once you think, you know, it's a cliche to say that history is written by the victors, 
but it's a cliche because it's true. But I think going beyond that is more important, is that history is written with an agenda. It's an agenda to prove the right of this person to, to rule. It's uh, an agenda to prove that it's okay to have enslaved people because these people don't matter as much as these people. And within women's history, um, women have always been there too. But you would be forgiven often for thinking that the only thing that women have ever done until very recently is to do a bit of embroidery. Mm. Um, and then the, the corollary to that is the idea of the one exceptional woman, the lone wolf. So the idea that, yeah, women did the embroidery, but, you know, Joan of Arc. Yeah, we agree Joan of Arc existed, but there were no other Joans of Arc. Mm. And we understand that Catherine de Medici and Elizabeth I were really powerful women and, you know, all of that. But there weren't any others. And that is the other thing that's really important about the book for me, is that that has been a very persistent idea that there are one or two exceptional women who weren't really women. Mm -hmm. they, they stepped out of the limitations put upon them. And so the job, in a way, of a book like mine, which is not meant to be read page after page, it's to be dipped into, and there are nearly a thousand women mentioned, some in passing and some much more significantly, is to say, of course we should have the statue to Millicent Garrett Fawcett or Emmeline Pankhurst. But let's also remember Rosina Skye. Let's also remember, you know, the, uh, Edith Morley, who was the first English professor, uh, first woman in England who was a professor, um, who was also part of the women's tax um, evasion, essentially, the women that said, you know, if, if we can't vote, then we're not paying the taxes, you know, essentially, which is very sensible. And then what does that do? That links you back to the beginning of the history that we know, which is in the New Kingdom in ancient Egypt. Women had absolutely the same rights, provided they have property. So you can't say that women's lives have got better or worse. You can say that at this period, women supported other women because they were there too. And then in other periods, women were completely suppressed and nobody had a voice. So it's that, it's about how we put all the women back. Yeah, so it's interesting what you mentioned about um, ancient Egypt. So I specialize in, in, in African history um, and Africa is known for having um, you know, cultures, especially that are both matriarchal um, yeah. and matrilineal. Um, so I come from my culture, for example, the Ashanti are both matriarchal oh, and matrilineal. Yeah, yeah. Battle and of the Golden Storm. Exactly, the Battle there of the Golden Storm. So she mentions, um, uh, I should it say. It sounds this. weird, but yeah. that is actually a thing. It is, you know, so what she mentions in, in you know, in Kate's book are um, in the Warrior Queens section of the book is, um, you know, one on, uh, you know, Ashanti Queen Mother who fought against the British um, for the Golden Storm. But um, linked sort of, in combination with that, you mentioned about how, um, you know, the history, or as it were, societies aren't necessarily always prog progressive. We think that, um, you know, the, the future is always better than the past or that we've, people today have more rights and freedoms than people a century ago. People a century ago have more rights and freedoms than people 300 years ago. Um, it's, you know, especially if you, you study history, you notice that not to not always be the case. Um, but, I mean, did you find in your book that actually in certain societies, obviously this depends on the society and the culture, but that it was actually easier in, in the past in some cultures for um, women to do certain things or that they had more rights and freedoms? I mean, I'm thinking particularly somewhere like uh, ancient Sudan in, in Kush, yeah. where there, yeah. you know, there was um, a matrilineal there as well, and there were um, uh, you know, successive queen mothers and um, even ordinary women. Um, you know, could leave their husbands, and you know there was there was a lot more lot more rights and freedoms than what came, for example, after you know um, the Muslim expansion, that kind of thing. Um, so did you did you find that or notice that yeah, in yeah. any places? No, absolutely. Or? And of course, I mean, the most obvious example, I suppose, at the moment, or two most obvious examples, is that before the Taliban went back and and took Afghanistan, went back into Kabul in August uh, 2021, there were more women in the Afghan parliament than any other parliament in the world. So we've gone back. So and that example. was lost in a matter mm. of three or four days. Uh, you know, Malala Yousafzai was shot in 2012 mm. by the Taliban in Pakistan for going to school. And we are now a year and a month over girls in, Afghan um, in, in Afghanistan not being allowed to go to school over the age of 13. So things can change very quickly. And it's, it's actually what Andrew and Hannah were saying, that sort of sense of the myths that exist, the idea that 
it, tradition has always been set in stone. Whereas it's always about power. It's always about who wants something and how are they going to get it. Um, and so that is absolutely the case with uh, women's lives, that you cannot say that women's lives have got better or worse. You've got to say where we, here they've got better, here they've got worse. But the thing that I think we all need to do, and this goes uh, true obviously in race, it goes true in uh, different physical abilities, it goes true for faith, is understand that nothing that we have was given to us. <coughs> Everything has been fought for by somebody at some moment. People have always disagreed about who deserves to have this or who has the right to have that. And oddly, once you kind of accept that, you realize that there is a responsibility to safeguard the rights that people have, however you look at, at that. Now, the thing is, uh, this book is fun. <laughs> I know I make you sound totally serious, um, but it, it's, it's joyous because what I found was um, that everywhere there are extraordinary stories. And we just need to keep reminding ourselves of these stories and also understanding that legacy matters. So take Mary Seacole, for example, who consistently comes top of every poll for the most famous or important black British woman. Now, she was celebrated in her day, but she had to really fight for it. The British authorities didn't consider her British. And so even though she had done extraordinary things in other parts of the world, when she said, I want to go to Crimea uh, to, to set up a hospital, they said, well, off you go then, but we're not helping, essentially. So she set up her own British hospital in Ukraine um, and became a superstar. And when she came back to London, I think it was 1857, I've got my notes, but I haven't got my glasses, so they're useless. Um, <laughs> it was um, that a, a fundraising gala was held for her on the banks of the Thames. Is that right? 1857, thank you. <laughs> Hurrah. Um, uh, I've gone into Baldrick now, obviously, because um, we are talking about history. Um, and it was, I mean, it was a, a huge event. And then she had a best-selling book, you know, the, um, her autobiography, essentially. And then because there was nobody safeguarding her legacy, saying, Mary Seacole matters, she completely vanished from the record. And she's only back in the record because campaigners said, what about Mary Seacole? So there are, there are all sorts of things. There's the silence in the archives. There's the fact that history is written with an agenda and women's histories are often left out of that. There is what is called in science the Matilda effect, which holds true in every other area, which is, it, the phrase was coined by the science writer uh, Margaret W. Roster, American writer, uh, which was essentially... And it was named after um, Jocelyn, uh, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, who was one of the uh, women at the Seneca Falls Convention in America, the big um, civil rights suffrage uh, moment in America, um, which was because people, science writers, didn't believe that women could be scientists. When they found women who were scientists, they misattributed their work to the men beside them. So, and this went on for a long time. Lise Meitner is the most obvious example. I think it was 1954. She was denied uh, the Nobel Prize in chemistry. It was given entirely to her male counterpart because they just can't, couldn't believe that she was anything more than the person who held his coat. Uh, so the Matilda effect is quite recognized very much in science and it holds true across the board. But this issue of legacy about how you keep even the famous women from disappearing is why you're all here uh, why everybody who's written a book has written a book, why I've written a book, is because repetition counts. The more you keep saying these same names, the more that people go, ah, because we've, we've heard a lot of the same names this evening. You know, we've talked, Churchill's come up a lot. I mean, not wrongly. This is not about ignoring the brilliant men, but it's what about all of those women whose names should trip off the tongue too? So that's kind of the point as well. Um, so you talk there about, you know, historians, anybody who's writing history has a particular agenda. Some, um, arguably, obviously this depends on the context and the time and the place, are more negative than others. I mean, one might argue that you've written this with an agenda, but a positive agenda, which is to redress the balance in history. Um, but then do you think it's possible ever to write objective history? Because then history is not then, you know, what we've, what at least was my impression when, when even when I was at school, which is it's a collection of 
uh, uh, facts, and these are things that definitely happened at this time, and this is the way that it played out. But you know, there's a stronger now. We're, we're sort of getting to understand that the memory plays a big part, and myth plays a big part, and that was a feature of both of the conversations we had beforehand. So um, then, in terms of writing history, do we accept that? Okay, there's always going to be a agenda. Let's just make sure our agenda is positive, although that's also <laughs> subjective, <laughs> I recognise. No, it's really hard. And I, I loved what Hannah said before about truth. Um, is it possible to be absolutely sure that the facts that we've got are the only facts? No. Is it better to try and fail than not try at all? Yes. That's what I think. It, you know, it's that wonderful Samuel Beckett phrase that's always misquoted, but the, the, the key bit that's left out is actually what matters. Try again, fail again, never mind, fail better. And I think it's, it is very hard, but what Hannah was saying about truth and, and referencing great Dame Hilary Mantel, who of course has just, uh, just recently died, is that people know the difference between a piece of historical fiction and the history. Or do they? So, you know, I write a lot about France. Um, one of the things that happens a lot when you're writing about the resistance in France is that there is a real, not fury, that would be very un-French because it would not be elegant. But there is a kind of, um, there is a frustration that when we talk about women within the Second World War, we talk about American and British SOE officers, some Polish, some German, but essentially there is again that myth of the British and American women were awfully plucky and they came in and they saved the day. And they were, they were extraordinary. But within France, there were huge numbers of women quietly in the resistance and a few in the Mackey. But when the um, medals were given out, there's about eight French women who got medals. More places in France got medals than women but we know at least 10 because they're our friends' grandmothers and great-grandmothers. So that's the other side about how you tell the truth is that some people don't want to be visible in what they did in history, but in terms of trying to find some sort of agreed uh, statement of what happened and when, it's easier with battles. You can disagree on... Um, the tactics or the, the moral right of any, you know, any particular battle. Um, and obviously, you know, I mentioned Lascarina Bubalina, but you could mention the um, Rani of Jansi, uh, of Jansi, who obviously, if you're on the British Empire side, she was a guerrilla warfare. If you're on the Indian side, she's a hero. So we've got to always acknowledge that. But if we can kind of just try to pin back, for me, it's kind of common sense. You know, I write a lot about the 16th century at the moment because I'm writing about the Huguenot diaspora. And there are, the only women that appear are Marguerite de Valois, Catherine de Medici, you know, the, the, the obvious people. But men have been away at war for a generation. So who do we actually think were printing the books and chopping the wood and opening the gates and ringing the bells? Because the men weren't there. <laughs> and those things were still happening. So for me, a lot of history is absolutely trying to pin down the facts and get it right but also using your common sense. Because it was, I think, I'm, I think it was Andrew who said it. Um, this was where my feminism comes from, that I would sit in classes in the 60s and the 70s, and I would study men, you know, I, I would study everything. And it took me a while to think, what's odd about this? Oh yeah, there's no women. But that wasn't my world. I was in a 2,000 strong comprehensive school of only girls. Um, there were almost no male teachers. Um, and I, I remember without having the language or the political acumen to find any way of processing that at the time, but I can very clearly remember thinking, this is odd, that dissonance. What I'm being told is history in these books is not my experience. And of course, you can amplify that for many different people. Of course. Um, so the book is a celebration of around a, a thousand women who've achieved in so many different fields. Um, and I was curious, obviously in our, again, this is sort of, um, you know, culturally relativistic, but there are certain fields and um, 
you know, certain aspects of society which might traditionally be perceived as more feminine, the arts, etc., and others which are, might be traditionally perceived as more masculine. So, for example, warfare. I mean, you know, there are exceptions. Um, uh, so you have, for example, in Dahomey, in, you know, the 19th century, an all-female warrior unit. The Amazons, the, Dahomey, the, Amazons, the Dahomey Amazons, Amazons, exactly. But um, in the course of your research, did you find that um, it was easier for women to break into or break through certain fields, those that were perceived as more feminine than those that were perceived as more masculine, so like piracy, warfare. So it was easier for them to become writers and artists and to make headway in, in those fields. Yes, you'd, you'd think yeah. that. Funnily enough, it, it wasn't easier for women to become artists, for example. And in classical music, I mean, if I had a quid for time every time somebody said to me, but there are no women classical composers. I would be a very rich woman. <laughs> um, and if you want to have that argument, there are many in the book and you will be rich as yourselves. Um, so there, is, there are certain barriers. So um, a lot of the arts, of course, were uh, sponsored or were within the court. Um, so you couldn't do them unless you were given permission to do them. And of course, women have always been prevented from publishing. Um, in, and in many places, women haven't been allowed to read. Um, and so you, you see those patterns. But obviously, it's, it's easier for a woman if she can get a, 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 you know, a, a flint and a slate or a, you know, the first named author in history is a woman, in Hedjuana, yes. good old Ed Hedjuana in the 23rd century uh, BCE. Um, but so, I mean, those things, obviously, because you can do them and then in a different sort of way. What I found really interesting was that there is a sense in a funny sort of way that the reason that women weren't doctors, say, was that they didn't really want to try. Um, and then when they did try, people went, oh, this is great, you're a doctor and let's give you a go. So what was salutary was discovering, for example, there was a, an act of parliament in 1511, which the Royal College of Physicians used as a way to justify not allowing women to be physicians until the 20th century. <laughs> Um, and what I, I did write the phrase down, but again, as I haven't got the glasses, but it was something like the um, ignorant multitude of women. Um, you know, so women shouldn't be doctors. And you go, but this is really weird because you need doctors, guys. You know, you really need some doctors. And of course, the famous first doctor, and some people say, well, she real or not, is Ag Agnodice um, in Greece in, in the fourth century BCE. And she was, you weren't allowed to be a doctor if you're a woman, or a physician. In fact, the doctor is quite a modern word, physician if you're a woman. But also, you weren't allowed to touch a woman if you're a man. So basically, that's let's all the women die. I mean, the, the, you know, it's insane. So she was a woman, and then her rival physician said, right, we hate this, this person because, you know, uh, she, they're, they're taking all our customers, essentially. And so she had to kind of prove in court that she was a woman rather than a man by, you know, and the whole thing is obviously a little bit apocryphal, but the law was then changed to allow women to be physicians. So what I found all the way through was that there were, sometimes it's just about custom and tradition and people not thinking that women could do these things and then proving that they could. Other times there was a deliberate attempt to stop women doing things. And the weirdest one, <laughs> in the context of the mighty lionesses in summer, and many of you will now know this story, was that during the First World War, the biggest sport in the UK was women's football. And most of the teams were attached to the munitions factories, and many of them had their own uh, teams. And the great Lily Parr, who I mentioned, was part of the most famous team, Dick Kerr Ladies. And the Boxing Day match in 1918 had a live audience of 48,000 people. It was just, they were superstars. And then what happened was the men came back from war and the FA didn't like the competition. And so they said to all the, uh, the leading clubs, you are not allowed to let women play on your ground. So it was an active decision to stop the women's game. It wasn't just that nobody wanted to do it. So that was the thing that I was most surprised that in every area there were active decisions like we're seeing in Afghanistan, for example, within education and in fact, all women's employment to stop women doing things. But often it was just, we've never had a woman before, so we don't know what to do with them. So it's just the culture shock of just- Well, yes, the, I mean, it's, it's, the, fa it's, just... it's the famous uh, mm. thing, I think in the Académie Française uh, yeah. with Mar Marguerite Yonecourt, where it says, I think it says, les hommes 
in Madame Yonacourt, so mm. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was the idea that the great men of letters were men. Um, they, they couldn't be women. Mm. Um, so, you know, my favorite bit of the book, um, I mean, it's a serious book. It's a love letter to history, uh, uh, you know, and what history is and why it matters. Because we know that, that people, politicians, use a fake version, a myth, a lot, you know, mythological version of history in order to justify bigotry and change now. We know that's why history matters. But also, there are just rather glorious things. So you will forgive me that I am just still incredibly abused by the fact that I discovered that... Um, in Chicago in the 1890s, a woman was clearly just really had enough. And she left her family and went to the shed at the bottom of the garden and she invented the dishwasher. <laughs> and it was like, yes, thank you, Josephine Cochran. Um, Josephine Cochran. And then she patented and set up her own uh, company, the, you know, the Cochran Garris Company. And that is still the basis of the dishwashers we have today. Um, or another one who I also rather love uh, was a, a German woman um, called uh, Madame Melita, um, who managed to spill her morning coffee um, also 19th century, on her son's homework and picked up the blotting paper and thought, uh-huh. <laughs> and that was the invention of the coffee filter paper. And so, so discovering that, for example, there are loads of women inventors. Um, and you think, well, you know, but if you asked, you know, the man on the Clapham Omnibus, can you name a woman composer? Can you name a woman inventor? They'd go, no. So it's just history completed. That's the point. Sure. History completed. Um, I mean, the book, as well as being a celebration of these around a thousand women, is also um, part detective story and part memoir. So um, you look at these other extraordinary women, but there's also an extraordinary woman um, who's your an ancestor or ancestress, um, Lily Watson, who was in her day in the 19th century, a famous novelist. And I think you only discovered recently, right, that, that you had yeah. um, this kind of literary blood <laughs> flowing know. through your veins. Um, I mean, what was that like actually finding out that, you know, you had someone else in your family who'd achieved so much um, in, in the arts and discovering more about well, her? Well, she gave me my work. way in. There are many people who are doing things like this in all sorts of areas, not just for women. Um, the idea that history must be uh, not partial. It must be all of us. Um, but the thing that gave me my in was this discovery that I knew that there was somebody in my family who it was also described as had written, you know, in that kind of <laughs> you know, writing kind of way. Uh, but when I went in search of her, I discovered that she had been a really famous novelist in her day, um, to the degree that when her most fa famous novel, The Vicar of Langthwaite, was published in 1893, the Prime Minister Gladstone wrote to the Times to say, hurrah! There was a new novel by Lily Watson, and indeed, in the I, I know quite. Can you imagine Lynn Truss? No, let's. Not. Can you imagine the ignominy if that happened? Uh, no, no. Um, anyway, um, I, don't, I, I don't think it's going to happen. But there we go. Um, so, so I looked into this and discovered that she'd written fourteen novels. They were all bestsellers in the day. She'd written more than a hundred articles. She was a correspondent for the Girl's Own Paper which was a rather moralizing, you know, this is how to produce good wife, wives and mothers, you know, very passionate about education in order to be good wives and mothers. Um, she wrote devotional uh, texts. It was a, she was a Baptist and then became Church of England when she was in her 60s, oddly, and never got to the bottom of that. Um, and then volumes of poetry. So my question was, if so, a white middle-class privileged woman who was very famous in her day has completely disappeared from the record. You can't find any mention of her in online dictionaries or in books or anything. She's just gone. Then what about everybody else? I mean, that, that was really where it came from. And I'd nearly finished the book. I was just telling my lovely friend Kate here um, about this. I was about to deliver it at Christmas. And my second cousin, wonderful Vanessa, rang up and said, I'm not sure whether you want me to tell you this or not. Okay, you know, book's about to go in. You know, I said, I found a deed box. Oh, yes, I said. I said, what's inside the deed box? And she said, about 500 letters from Lily to her husband. Like, <laughs> Which, of course, is the one thing you dream of as a researcher. But not two weeks before the book's supposed to be delivered. <laughs> and it was like, oh, my God. Um, but then out of that, so they wrote to each other several times a day. And I realised it's kind of like people text now. 
really. Just, you know, I will see you at the five o'clock train. But then I discovered within my own family history, there was this awful kind of hidden tragedy, which was um, that all of the women were carriers for haemophilia and all the boys and men were haemophiliac. And nobody had ever mentioned this to me at all. I mean, I'm not sure when it would have come up, possibly. Um, but when I spoke to my other cousin, I said, did you know this? She said, oh yes, I had to be tested. And so then I found letters from Lily describing what it was like to sit at the bedside of her 12 year old son as he took three years to bleed, three days to die. Um, and that was again, really extraordinary because that reminded me that that is also what history is. That even if we're writing the history of Queen Victoria, or Yara Shant, you know, whoever, that, and I suppose we've just seen it with the funeral of, of Queen Elizabeth. Because personally, you know, I looked at the king and the queen consort, and I thought, you really look like you need to sit down now. You know, grieving in the public eye. So all of history is also the story of one person and their heart and their hopes and their, and the minute you, Think of history like that. It's just, well, some people have more visibility and others don't, but it, they're the same emotional stories up to a point being told. And that's what I, you know, it was a great joy for me. The weirdest thing I found out was this. Um, I have two children. That's not weird. I know that. Um, <laughs> uh, my daughter is called Martha. Um, it turns out that Lily's name was actually Martha. And I didn't know that because she's always been known as Lily Watson. But when I got the birth certificate, it was like, oh, she's called Martha. Um, which was, and, and she, you know, she'd written a, a lot, you know, a lot of stuff, yeah. and like I said, was you know, a luminary in her day. Um, but you mentioned she com she'd completely disappeared. I mean, did you find, uh, apart from her early stories, I know that when she was um, sort of, it was like around eleven, twelve, she was writing pirate stories and fairy yeah, yeah. tales and that kind of stuff, um, which you did find. But did you find any of her complete? I mean, is there? Yeah, I've got. I you know, managed to get. Uh, well, when I say I, my husband managed to track down um, on A books and things like this. Um, I've got about eight of her fourteen novels. I've been able to find those, um, and my poor publishers are, you know, being very nice about why possibly we're not going to put them all back into print <laughs> at this moment. Um, but. Um, I have, you know, the book finishes, I have written her a Wikipedia entry oh. because um, that's, I mean, you will all probably know this, but this point about who gets to write history and how the record happens, and it was mentioned, Wikipedia was mentioned earlier, the figures are really salutary there because about 90% of people who post on Wikipedia are men. Um, now, so ladies, we need to step up, but that also explains why there is such a disproportionate number of men versus women on Wikipedia. Um, not because men are not wonderful and write about women as well, but by and large, um, people tend to write about the thing that they're interested in or that they know about. And therefore there is a disproportionate, um, you know, there's an imbalance in terms of the history of the world. But I did discover that Lily's daughter has got a Wikipedia entry because she was um, a writer, she wrote under the name Pamela Wynne. And now I had heard that there was somebody in the family who wrote racy books. <laughs> um, and they were really, for the time, apparently, super racy. She wrote 60 novels. Two of them were made into films in the 40s and they had terrible titles. Like, I mean, one of them was like, and an idiot. You know, that was just a completely stupid title. Um, but I mean, they were, they were basically women who went out and they were all scatty and, you know, they found the love of a good man, usually in India, because she was in India at the time. Um, but then she came back and divorced. So this was all in, you know, catastrophe, obviously. Um, so I discovered all of these kind of things. And I also was very connected to the, to my family. You know, the Lake District was incredibly important to my dad. Um, the first time we took a boyfriend, my boyfriend, obviously not a random boyfriend, on holiday, <laughs> you, you look good, come with us, um, on holiday to the Lake District. Um, my dad climbed Causey Pike, which mattered a lot to him. My granny was a friend of Beatrix Potter's and they spent the time in Newlands Valley and Little Town and Causey Pike and Cat Bells. And my dad was there with his brother and his mum and dad on the 3rd of August, uh, 3rd of September, 1939, to hear war had been declared. And going back into my great grandmother's history, I realized why that was all so important to him. And the great sadness for me is that my lovely dad is not here, um, or my granny, 
um, to talk to him about it. And I, that's the one thing about history. If any of you are interested in these things, try and do it while those people in your lives are still here to ask, because there are so many things now that are like flies in a jar in my head that I would, I so wish I'd asked. Um, and I, I won't find out now because there's nobody left to ask. Um, and I've, I think I've tracked down every piece of paper, but it's, you know, it's, it comes back to the fact that history matters and history is personal. You know, the old feminist rallying cry, the personal is political. I think that's there a very, very lovely yeah. note <laughs> to end on. I'm afraid we have to stop there, but um, thank you very much, Kate, for being here. So please join me. Thank you. Well done.